Hello, my name is uh, Michelle. I'm really excited to be here um, to talk about personal um, data, blockchain, and privacy. Um, this is really a topic that I um, truly love. Um, so this is not legal advice. I am an attorney. <laughs> Um, just a little bit of background about me. Um, I was an attorney at PayPal, and before that, um, I worked at a few um, different companies. I used to draft a lot of privacy policy, uh, work a lot on data, and um, also emerging technologies such as AI, blockchain, and Internet of Things, including sensors. Um, I know that we're focusing on blockchain today, but I will chat a little bit about AI and um, IoT as well. There are, um, we're gonna go over some of the basic principles of privacy um, that I think everyone knows um, uh, now, and then we're gonna talk about some laws in California and also in Europe, and then we're gonna go, uh, go dive into blockchain and, and the intersection of data privacy and uh, blockchain. So there are seven principles of privacy. Um, since we're in Germany, I think every one of you guys know this. Um, I think it's really important to understand the concept because when you're building products and when you're working on data, it's kind of nice to architect your system um, around it. And they are notice choice on word transfer, security, data integrity, SS, and recourse enforcement and liability. Um, so with notice, um, you want to tell your community um, or user when, before you use your data, how your data will be used. Um, most of it is a privacy policy on uh, your website. And, uh, and if you're repurposing the data, it's also important to let your community know before um, you reuse their data so that they know what the, pur the new purpose is, uh, especially for health data. I was just having a conversation with someone about how the health community or the science community wants to contribute their data to health science research. Um, however, how do we encrypt that data uh, and allow the person to share only what they want to share. And of course, um, choice is important. And with choice, it's really opting out, you know, allowing your consumer to opt out and also opt in if it includes sensitive information. What is sensitive information, right? So health data. Uh, trade unions, uh, spiritual religious beliefs are some examples of sensitive information. Um, you know, because people, or insurance company can do things to you um, once they have that information. And so it's really important to allow people to opt in. And then, of course, onward transfer, um, I think with when you're building a startup or a company, you use you have different partners, you have different partners, and um, you work with different company from, you know, and you have different vendors. They might have bad data, especially in the age of AI, and edge computation, and sensors. So how are they using the data? Remember, when another party is using the data, you really can't control that and you don't know what they're doing with that data, right? So you wanna make sure that in your agreement with them that everything is cleared and you set good expectations and make sure that they comply uh, with the law because you could be liable, right? Another uh, principle is really security. Um, how are you protecting your data? A lot of the breaches is insider, right? So someone in the company basically may compromise the data. So how are you protecting it? Uh, what kind of software are you using? What kind of hardware are you using? Um, what kind of password system um, are you building in to, um, to your security uh, procedures and measures? 
And then, of course, is data integrity. So with fake news and a lot of fake videos, um, is, the information, does, is the information you have, are they authentic? Um, could someone modify that, right? Especially when we're talking about blockchain and how that preserve integrity. Um, is it centralized? So um, with integrity, data integrity, um, do you allow your users and community to go in and collect that data? How long are you keeping it? What is the purpose? And if you are aggregating data, are those information um, identifiable? And that's very important, right? Because with metadata and AI, um, there are situations where you don't see the name or the address or the email. However, you can tell who is it. And um, so we should be careful about that. And I'm, I was referring to uh, the, Naps, the Netflix case where there was a mom uh, who was, um, I think she was uh, homosexual. Um, so with, without her information, people could kind of tell. So I think we need to be sensitive about metadata and even if the information is aggregated to make sure that it's clean and that the person is not identifiable. And then of course is access. Um, who has access to that? to that information, is it reasonable? So when consumers want what, uh, want a record of what you keep about them, do you let them know? And can they actually read it and understand it? Um, and can they amend or delete those information? So we are really thinking some, when you think about some of these big companies today, uh, I would not name them. <laughs> But if you go and look at your data, can you really understand what they have about you? Probably not. It's kind of segmented, it's pursed. Um, you can't really tell. And even if you could tell, what else do they know about you and how are they identifying you? Um, you really don't know their judgment about you and how they profile you, even if you know what you have given to them or what they keep about you. Um, Recourse enforcement liability is um, if you, if your partner is breaching the data, or you, you know, and you really need to have them as a partner. What are you going to do? Um, how are you letting people? Um, how are you like rect rectifying the situation if there's a data breach? Um, and how are you working with government officials? Um, so those are really really important. So I'm going to go over a few um, health and data laws. Um, it's, I'm focus on the U.S. Um, and uh, so this is HIPAA. I remember when I was uh, working at eBay in about early 2000, um, HIPAA and uh, the Child Privacy Act just kind of came out, and. Uh, I think now data has become even more important. Um, so it's 1996, which is about right. It protects, because the internet kind of came out around that time, or at least publicly. Um, it protects personal um, and health data. It applies to Cover entities, health plan, health care, uh, health care provider, and clearing house. And also who you disclose it to. And uh, it basically allows you to have your, uh, your health records if you request it. So what is health protected information? It's basically your, identifi your identifiable health information, um, your past, present, or future physical or mental health, um, who provides that health care, and how much you pay for those services. So those are some of the health record um, you're allowed to Disclose to yourself if you requested it to certain healthcare provider. Um, it the the issue with that is that if.
if it's aggregated data, you can still share it. So there's an exception there, um, public interest and benefit activities in a limited data set. So if you um, have aggregated data, if they use aggregated data for public interest and benefit, you can still disclose it without consent. And then also, what is the way that you protect um, those data? You're recommended to have a privacy officer. I think sometimes as a startup, you really don't have the funds to do that at the beginning. But if your companies are heavily relied on data, it's kind of important to have one. I certainly work with privacy data officer before, and I think I think it's super awesome. Um, however, when you, when you're small and you're a founder, I think it's really important to really think and at least make an attempt to understand uh, the concepts and principles. So there's training, um, so training your staff, there's safeguards, there's mitigation, and then there's a whole process. So it's important to have a, a privacy policy uh, for external, uh, your customers, your consumers, and the users, but also to have a process for the internal, which is really your team, your staff, and, and how your vendor will share that information. And there's a hefty penalty for breaching it. Um, and it goes up every time it is validated. And I think, I think it's good. I think it deters um, healthcare providers so that they won't breach our data. Um, and I think it's even better if they give us the terms before they prefer, perform the procedures or any kind of health procedures. Um, so I'm going to talk about the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, it, this is really um, restricted to California. And it's really important because it's very like the GDPR. Um, and it applies to, and this is effective on January 1, 2020, so in a, in a few months. Um, it's very important because it, in a way, it defines all, it has a list of all the data that companies, uh, businesses need to really think about. And it applies to co any companies that have customers in California. So GDPR applies to everyone, all the businesses that have consumers or, or users in Europe. This one applies to anyone that has customers in California. It applies online as well as physical businesses. And uh, there is a minimum requirement that you have to make revenues over, gross revenues have to be over 25 million. Um, you basically received a uh, sale or share personal information of 50,000 or more consumer, or you make 50% or more revenue from sale of personal information. So there is a threshold for that. Um, so if you don't, if your business is not mainly to sell data, or um, you don't have that amount of consumer data and you make less than 25 million, the, the uh, law does not apply to you. So what is personal information? So for the first time, I've seen um, personal information defined in, very, very, uh, in a very detailed, detailed way. So it includes social security number, biometric, identifiers, geolocation. Um, so that is all your, uh, all the IP addresses, your browsing history, that includes uh, your avatar, your sound, your, your, uh, your video data, um, any, um, you know, tracking, special tracking devices. Um, behavioral and profiling data is very important because there are companies out there that does behavioral analysis of you from the beginning of the internet. And uh, they know what you will buy, what you will buy next, how much you would pay for it, and they sent you targeted ads. Um, and they have a digital copy of you, um, especially with AI. So I thought that was really cool that they have it there. Um, Sensory data, you know, will include uh, VR, AR, um, and then all the all the tracking data and the biometric identifiers are going to be include um, all the IoT sensors. 
So for the first time, all the data, everything about us, what we do, is gonna, well, in, that is in the definition of personal information. So with CCPA, what is really cool about it is that, you know, in California, we have a law that, I mean, in the US, we have a law that protects children. With uh, the California Consumer Protection Act, it basically says that if you're, you're 13 or 16 years old, your parents' consent is required, um, and you basically have the right to opt in. So if you have users that are between that age, and, and you, even if you're not intended to target against them, but at them, but you know that they're using the site, you know, uh, one of the best practices is to have a different landing page for them. And, and because they need to have, uh, they need to opt in. So that is very different um, from, from a little bit of the other laws and regulations. And of course, you have to disclose uh, to your consumer. Um, there's actually, there's a, you know, if, if this applies to you, you basically have to have a special paragraph. Um, I mean, this should be part of your privacy policy and also um, you need to have a disclosure, a link on uh, your website that is conspicuous. So basically, like very out there, so that they really know and they can opt out. Um, the CCPA also talks about third party transfers as well. Um, so. Consumers can request their data, just like GDPR, um, and there must be consent. And uh, also, um, I think, yeah, so um, people can also opt out, and uh, you, you, when you, you also have, an, you have to have an agreement with your uh, vendors and partners about how they're using the information. So these are some of the compliance mechanism and they're described. Um, they're, you have to provide a toll-free telephone and website address uh, on your website. It must be within 40 day, five days of request. Um, you, have to update, you should update your privacy policy and there, there should be a do not sell my personal information link uh, on your website. Um, it is enforced uh, by the California Attorney General with penalty. So as you can see, um, this looks very familiar to, to everyone here. And it basically steps it up a little bit regarding the definition of what personal information is. Um, and it um, we, we has additional application to children because normally it's 13 and under. So they basically, you know, from 13 to 16, there's a special requirement. And uh, they wanna make sure that disclosure is conspicuous. Um, and, you know, the violations will be enforced. There, there is a concept there uh, regarding incentives and discrimination. Um, so if someone, if a consumer doesn't want to use the website because of their privacy concern, and you basically cannot discriminate them. Um, you can provide incentive, uh, so like a different kind of services and good, but you cannot uh, by discri discriminate them by changing different prices, quality and services. So for example, if I wanted to opt out of a, of a website because I don't want to share my data, but you know, there's nothing there except I can log in, um, you know, or there might be minimal products that might be okay. However, they want me to charge, um, you know, like five bucks or something, you know, when it's free, you know, then that's a little bit, there may be discrimination. So this is a concept that I think, you know, might be, you know, um, discussed in the future, you know, about what is discrimination, what are considered incentive, and uh, how are different levels of services, um, I mean, how do, how do we 
as even creators of website and consumer of well, technology, how do we um, provide that and comply with that? So I have some best practices um, for every, everyone here. Um, <laughs> one one uh, thing that we could do is have a separate homepage for a California consumer. However, is that a slippery slope? Do we need a homepage for every state and every country? Um, you know, consent from children 13 or 16 before cookies and pixel data, you know? Do we need like to dele delegate different resources just to comply with children uh, who are 13 to 16? How do we do that, um, even if we want to? Um, and uh, how do we get their consent? Um, so, you know, um, if they opt out, disable cookies and pixel data. Uh, if if there are children, and if there's a way, you know, and if they're not lying, right? Sometimes children lie about their age to have access, um, especially gaming um, or certain, you know, like certain social media sites. You know, they they might be under 13. Um, so. Or, or you know, 17. You know, so it's really important that we identify age, um, or not provide the website before we um, know their age. So I'm going to talk a little bit about GDPR. I think um, the community here knows it since we're in Europe. Um, so the, there's e-privacy regulation. Um, that protects the private life if, of different individuals. And then there's also um, the GDPR. I'm gonna just kind of go really fast on this because you know, I think everyone here knows GDPR. It's May 25, 2018. Um, it's to protect our personal data. Um, and it gives us control over data. Um, it's consistent across European Union, and we have 72 hours to notify of data breaches. So when you think about blockchain, um, we are supposed to have control over our data, right? Um, and it's intended to also protect data so that those will not be tampered with. And uh, I, I just kind of want you to really think about um, the, the technology and uh, the consensus layer, um, the blockchain layer, um, as well as the intention of data portability. Um, and then also the rights to be deleted and forgotten, right? Because if the blockchain is immutable, how can we be forgotten and deleted if we can't even issue chargebacks and we can't delete information? Um, and uh, since blockchain is public, um, can we provide consent and access, right? When we buy Bitcoin, some data about us are posted on the website. Um, you know, we can pretty much stock someone. Uh, we know certain data about them. Um, so GDPR is consent about, I think these are pretty um, simple. So you need to have consent, you need to have, you know, provide um, the purpose of it and uh, parental consent is a minor. Um, you can withdraw your consent, you, ha you can't basically die. Um, and uh, be deleted. And uh, there's always debates about, you know, are you really deleted from the servers and from backups, archives? Um, and can you be deleted if your information is on the blockchain? Probably not, right? And uh, even on servers, are, you know, are you really dead? And, uh, you know, if you actually die, um, you know, what happens to that information, right? And like, even if you physically die, what does Facebook and other companies do with, with your data? Um, there's also exceptions, of course, uh, for GDPR. Um, so, 
that is important to know. And uh, one of the one of the exceptions is always, you know, like a public interest for safety. Um, the government um, have authority, right? Um, there's some legitimate interest with it. And uh, here, I just want to note that is centralization, right? So you know, we have a government that basically protects our data and gives us these laws. You know, with blockchain, the whole idea of decentralization is that we can control and protect our data, and, and there's an open governance. Um, so how do we balance that? Is that the right thing to do it and protect our personal data, or should we govern ourselves? Um, and what is, what is really public interest and legitimate interest? Um, I have some best practices for GDPR um, to have a personal data and breach register. Privacy by design, as you know, is you know, how do you design your, your structure, your, your system, so that it keeps in your personal data as little as possible uh, in a short amount of time, just as necessary to process that data. Um, there's a concept called privacy by default as well. By default as well, uh, you know, it's really regarding the structuring of, you know, how what kind of consumer data do we need? Do we need everything to make the system work? How long should we keep it? You know, what is really the absolute minimum? Um, so again, data protection officer, which is your privacy officer, you know, your controller. Um, Impact assessment is really your data privacy analysis. Um, and have a, a breach register. So keeping track of your breaches and the information is gonna be really, really important. And then we talk about blockchain. Um, blockchain, blockchain has certain characteristics as well. So it has hashes of transactions or groups of transactions. So those are uh, basically protected by cryptography. It's supposed to be very secure. But really think about some of the systems around that though. Um, are exchanges on the blockchain? Why are they always hacked? Um, you know, because when we think about blockchain, we really think about public ledger, but we forget that around the ecosystem, there are other things like exchanges, you know, basically that keep all the money. Are they protected? Are they secure? How are they, do how are they um, keeping and protecting our data? You know, are they compliant with, you know, KYC, AML regulations and laws? Um, and uh, so there's also public and private. Um, you know, it's, it's not uh, it's not uh, anonymous, right? There's certain information that's public. There's certain information that's private. Um, so what should be public and what should be private? Um, we don't really have a consensus about that, right? We have privacy laws that again tell us. Uh, what what information how what, what how information is defined as personal and sensitive, but you know does it tell us what is public and private? And I think it's really something that the community has to think about, especially in science and health. Um, immutable records, so the records we cannot change. You know we, we can't even have chargebacks. Um, we can correct and delete them. How do we do it, right? Um, we have private keys and public keys. Um, you know, that's more of an asset, so that protects it somewhat, right? So you need your private keys to go in and get certain information uh, for access. Um, but is that is that enough? Is that like our password? I wanted to talk a little bit about the current PCI standards. Um, and that, that regards to more of financial data, you know, because I think health and financial data is really important. And when we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about currency. Uh, and currency is money, right, or funds. And uh, I think it's kind of important to at least understand some concept of what the financial industry thinks about when they think about personal data and how to handle personal data as we're building the blockchain ecosystem. So we have um, a secure network, so we think about firewalls and password and how to protect them. Uh, we, think, we think about cardholder data, how, how they're stored and how we're transmitting them. 
Um, so storage and transmission of blockchain, I think, is, is pretty secure, right? Um, however, not on the exchanges. Um, software, antivirus, and other security system and application. So we think about software, we think about access, we think about transmission. And then uh, we also think about people, right? Most of the breaches are actually insider threats. So who has access to that information? Um, how are the people vetted? Um, do we do diligence to everyone? I mean, in this space, there's a lot of fraud. You know, who is real and who is not? How do we identify them? And what kind of processes? Who do we hire? Do, have they done, you know, have you done a criminal background check on them, right? Um, I think it's kind of important to really ask those questions, um, especially in a new industry. Um, Access control, need to know, you need ID, physical access, right? Um, you know, can you, can you use special IDs to provide on smart contracts on the sensor to let people, to, to allow people to restrict access to certain loca physical location? Um, information security, to so have um, training for your staff, um, contractors, um, as well as employees. Um, how is your monitoring and testing on your network? You know, um, you know when is there any like emergency use cases um, or things that you test out so you know what to do when there is a breach? I think that's very important. But these apply to like current systems of financial data, um, not blockchain per se. But I just want to make sure that we breach the gap. Um, that we know what the current situation is like and then think about the newer technology and how that could be um, applicable. So when we talk about blockchain, um, you know, how do we delete stuff when everything is, when we can't change record? Um, can we really be forgotten? And what is the, what is the balance between data, integrity, and privacy? So you know, on the blockchain, you can't change records, so there is integrity. But yet, you know, when you make a mistake, it's really hard to correct. Um, and privacy is just half, right? Um, it doesn't protect everything. And then when we think about security on the blockchain, it's secure by cryptography. Um, however, really think about the partnering technology um, and vendors, how are they, you know, how are they protecting their data? You have security, smart contract audits, audits, you know, you have exchanges, right? Um, and you have other data set with AI. How are those information um, protected? So I think um, it's really important to understand that. And uh, there is public blockchain and permission blockchain. Um, Permission blockchain are basically private blockchain. Um, I usually recommend more of a hybrid model because I think user data should be protected. And uh, if they're stored on a permission blockchain or on you know, a private storage database, uh, it, it, it might be better uh, and to really separate certain information. And uh, consensus, right? Um, it's supposed to be trustless. Um, at the same time, it's not completely trustless. Um, and uh, do we do, you know, can, and who could we trust, right? Um, are those, is it centralized um, or is it concentrated? I think those are really important questions. And then also data sharing. Um, if you form an association with 100 members um, and they basically run a node, do all those, are those information shared? Um, do they have access to that information? And how are they shared, right? And uh, it's kind of important because, you know, if we have a company that has a history of misusing our data, um, and beyond their privacy policy, beyond anything that we can imagine, and they have a member of 100 um, companies, and each company has different data, right? One has where you go to, one has what you purchased, you know, um, the other one is, might be a payment provider that basically knows exactly your, the time you buy things, what you buy, um, where you're going to. Um, and 
it might, they might consist of nonprofit, right, that has your donation history and what kind of things you like. All the data, you know, that they have about you, what, what, what are they going to do with it, right? And what if they have your health data along with that? So now they have your writing history, your health data, your e-commerce data, um, you know, all your trans payment transaction. Um, you know, and, and what are their inter-agreement deals, right? So if that association is run by a big company with lots of users, with a lot of money, um, you know, is there any inter-agreements, inter-company agreements that you don't know about? Right? And how are they shared? And then also validation on notes. As you, as you know, um, they have authority to approve or disapprove your transaction. What can they see? Um, and is there, is there a balance between da data sharing versus privacy? You know, you think that your information is private, but, you know, with the, the amount of association and notes, you know, doesn't it sound like it's worse than the current situation? Right, because now you now you basically deal with a merchant, uh, or you work with a digital wallet that allows you to pay for something, and then you're done. But here it seems like it has a lot of players in the system that is outside of the chain. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for the interesting and important topic and talk. Are there any questions? No questions? So then I have one myself. So there is this vision in the blockchain world. Like yesterday we had like ocean protocol where you where you can bring the compute to the data mm -hmm. instead of the data to the compute. Like today, you have a few data, you give it to Facebook, and then they can do post-processing and stuff. Yeah. So there's like uh, the Ocean Protocol, they have the idea, so we just like bring the algorithms there, they train on the data, and uh, just like get the training information from the data mm -hmm. and like store it somewhere. I think you're aware of these concepts, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. So, okay. Yeah, so, so um, I've been... So how, how, yes, yeah, how is it? So I've been like talking to different people around data privacy uh, lately, right? So one company is basically making sure that the, the health data, um, they're working with um, health provider, like, and this is a real use case. Um, so they work with a health um, provider and they basically encrypt your data and make sure that nothing is identifiable um, and is completely aggregated and secure. And it, they work with uh, researchers, um, scientists, to make sure that they don't know anything about, about you. Um, and this is with the blockchain. I think I thought that's really cool because it yeah. basically tracks everything. Uh, however, th there's also that balance with privacy. Um, I also spoke uh, with someone who, um, one of the inventors of the internet. Um, um, and um, when we talk a little bit tar about targeted, um, targeted advertising and uh, the right to basically, everything that you share with Facebook basically belongs to you and you can delete it. So it's traceable. So it's, I thought that was really cool, yeah. you know. Um, you know, so if I say, you know, I like a green dress, right, and I don't want that to be out there anymore, I can basically delete that, and it pulls that data from, face, from Facebook. Yeah. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I think uh, that blockchain also allows um, for data portability, um, in, in a way, because I think once we have the technology for identity, right, and identity includes AML, KYC, and other information uh, about you, I think the future um, could be, could be, you know, you give me controls about, I can share it out with you. It's not on different platform, right? So my, my ratings and social r ratings could be, you know, here's Facebook, here's Twitter, here's LinkedIn. Um, here's my information, and this is me, right? And I could say yes, no, LinkedIn, yeah, yeah. you know, okay, no Facebook, Twitter, this is okay. You know, and I think we need to build technology that allows us and, care and be conscious about 
about us and, and the control is from within, it's not from you know the different platform. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. like what can we enable that? Yeah. Like it's a decentralized way. Yeah, it's decentralized. Man maintaining our own key in a wallet or like or as you said, like identity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it allows yeah. us yeah. to mm -hmm. delete from the inside yeah. out okay, and not good. on different platforms. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions or any questions? Okay. But, but yep, okay. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, when comparing CCPA to GDPR, um, would you say that uh, to enforce compliance, uh, CCPA would also require or enforce uh, anonymization techniques? Yeah, I, I think CCPA for me is a little bit more detailed than the GDPR. Um, I, I would, um, I think I have like a number of best practices um, with me <laughs> on my on my uh, on my phone. Um, but one of it is really um, make sure that you have certain um, provisions in your contract with your vendor that cover um, the different privacy laws. You know, because I think we have confidentiality, um, but we might not have um, privacy. Right? Because most people have a privacy agreement and, and you know, is referred to, but people don't really think about uh, breaches of, of uh, privacy and how, how, how it is important. But I think now, I think we need to basically go through every vendor contract and make sure that they also agree to compliance of privacy and having like a provision about that and have some kind of identification. Of course, this is like general information and I'm not your lawyer and all that cool. stuff. <laughs> Yeah, but I have, a, I have a whole list and we can kind of talk about, cool. um, you know, just different best practices. Cool. Yeah. So, in regards to the roads, uh, um, controlling, protecting the data, mm -hmm. is there such a thing as well? The road attacks and it's uh, from uh, responsibility? Yeah, it has, um, it has strong responsibilities. Um, it, you know, it gives you a certain hour to respond. And, uh, and just really certain information needs to be provided. Um, so I think with GDPR, you, you categorize the, the, the information. Um, so with CCPA as well, um, you know, they're just, it, it's a little bit more detailed and you have to comply with a certain time. It's effective on January 1, 2020. So I think a lot of companies are beginning to, um, to make sure that they comply with it. Yeah. Okay then, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much for coming on today. Thank you. Very much.